please, yeah, thank you. Please join me in welcoming Ashkan. And um, Ashkan is going to talk to us about the remarkable random holomorphic function and its generalization. Thank you very much, Ashkan, and good to see you. Thank you, Case. Thank you. Good to see you too, Case. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, uh, so may I, can I start sharing my screen? Please do. Please do. Super. Thanks. Yeah, so if it, oh, it doesn't give me the option anymore to share, but yeah, but uh, I, I know, I think, I, no, but I know why, don't worry. I think this is, a, I start to understand how this is, yeah. Okay, it's working now. The random part into it, yeah. So do you want me to turn the camera off or you you, you, you don't uh, mind having, uh, having yeah, on this as you like? Maybe, maybe some of us will turn the camera off. Maybe you can keep yours on. Uh, okay. Okay, so well, it's as you like. I mean, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how we go. All right. So uh, yeah. So first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation to talk, and it's it's a pleasure to to be there and to see uh, through screen uh, some familiar and friendly faces. So today, so I, I mean, the talk is the same as the one I announced. I slightly changed the title, and you will see why uh, during the course of uh, of the talk. I mean, this is this is the same talk, and uh, so I'll try to give you a, a general overview of uh, what I, uh, I mean, uh, my personal journey into uh, what we could call probabilistic number theory. So I'm going to try to explain what this is, at least uh, to me and to, yeah, to some of the people with whom I work, and uh, illustrate this uh, through uh, one example, uh, specific example. And uh, I'll try to give you general ideas and uh, skip technicalities because some of the results require uh, a lot of technical details that would be bothering for people who are not uh, interested in, uh, in, the, in this uh, field. So the first thing, so I'm going to, uh, to so the main uh, object in this talk, I mean, the, so the, the main actor is uh, the Riemann zeta function. So it is defined for uh, the real part of S uh, strictly greater than one as this uh, classical Dirichlet series. And it has this uh, so-called Euler product representation. Uh, whenever my indexes are, uh, uh, P, it means that uh, they run over prime numbers. So, uh, so one of the main uh, breakthrough in analytic number theory by, made by Riemann in his memoir was to uh, show that this function can be analytically uh, extended to uh, the whole complex plane with a pole at one. And uh, so it is more convenient to take, uh, to consider the uh, C function which in turn will be uh, entire holomorphic in the whole complex plane. And it satisfies this functional equation. And uh, from there, uh, uh, Riemann in his 1859 uh, memoir already uh, conjectured that, uh, so, so this function here should have uh, zeros at uh, even negative integers so to account for the poles of this gamma here. And otherwise, all uh, remaining zeros should lie on uh, the line with a real part one half, meaning that all zeros should be of the form one half plus uh, i gamma n, where gamma n is a uh, real number. And so this is uh, the famous Riemann hypothesis, and it is still a uh, conjecture today. And uh, uh, so this is going to be so yeah so that's uh, so that that's that's what started the whole uh, the whole story in 1859. So so Riemann wanted to prove. I mean he he considered uh, uh, the zeta function and he continued in an attempt to prove the prime number theorem. So that's where he made uh, uh, this guess. And uh, so there are many things you can say about the zeta function to prove, and there are many things you cannot prove. And uh, there are many uh, results that you would wish. Uh, you could be able to, to guess what they should be. At least there's one result which, is, uh, which has been known for, uh, uh, I think, since the 19th century, essentially, uh, late 19th century, is uh, the von Mongol formula, so which is the, the number of zeros of the zeta function 
on uh, the critical line in a rectangle. So if I get back here, so what this says, this functional equation says is that uh, the zeros, uh, so th they come, uh, so they, they're symmetric about the uh, real uh, axis. And if essentially, if S is a zero, then one, uh, then one minus S is, a, is, a, is a also a zero. And then uh, you, you can use the, the, the symmetries, but if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, it means that if one half plus gamma i, uh, I gamma n is zero, then one half plus minus one i gamma n is also a zero. So uh, now if you count the number of zeros uh, on the uh, positive uh, uh, upper half plane, then uh, it is of order uh, t divided by 2p log of t divided by 2pe plus something that's uh, of order at most uh, log t. So this is uh, so this is a I mean, this is just a uh, variation of argument principle, and uh, so now so this is so this is the object. So I just wanted to quickly uh, fix the notation and so on. So now what is uh, so here uh, here everything is is deterministic, so nothing is random. So then uh, so what is a uh, probabilistic number theory? Then I mean so. I try to to try to break it into three different things that I will try to illustrate during this this talk. So, one uh, could say that uh, probabilistic number theory is about a, a convergence of uh, a sequence of random variables or uh, probability measures defined in an arithmetic way. So, for instance, uh, something I'm not uh, co covering today, but which is very well known is the, so there's an extra hole for at Erdős, sorry about that. So it's the Erdős CAC theorem, which, which gives us a central limit theorem about uh, the number of distinct prime divisors of uh, uh, integers. So uh, I'm going, but I'm going to give you, illustrate this, for instance, with uh, the zeta function uh, uh, soon. The other thing is to try to construct a, a naive probabilistic model to guess or conjecture uh, the sort of arithmetic looking theorems that I mentioned here. So for instance, uh, it is known that uh, the, the way the Erdős-Kac theorem was uh, proved was uh, Katz had a uh, probabilistic model based on uh, being divisible by a prime P, which was a sum of uh, independent Bernoulli index by primes with parameter one over p, and he used this as a model to guess that, there, uh, that the number of distinct prime divisors should satisfy a central limit theorem. And then Paul Erdős uh, then proved this uh, sort of uh, suggestion made by the probabilistic model. And naive here stands for the fact that very often you will need to make some assumptions about independence. For instance, uh, in the case of Erdős Kak is being being, in the, being divisible by different different prime is considered as being independent, which is only true uh, uh, asymptotically and not, uh, so it, that's why it's, it's called naive. You have to make some assumptions like independence and so on. And then the third part uh, I see in the, the third uh, aspect of probabilistic number theory is that uh, this in turn give, uh, gives new uh, uh, problems often open of independent interest and this is the part I wish to illustrate here is, uh, and this has been uh, a lot the case in the past two decades in the recent interaction between uh, random matrix theory and analytic number theory. So this is, uh, so this is what I'll try to do today is to try to, with some examples, uh, without going into details, just giving ideas, try to cover a bit uh, what, uh, yeah, uh, to illustrate uh, these three points here. So the first point, uh, as I mentioned, is the convergence of a sequence of random variables, uh, which are defined in an arithmetic way. So here's a, so here's a, here's a theorem which dates back, I think, to the, to the 1950s from uh, Selberg, which is uh, called the Selberg Central Limit Theorem, that I have restated in a uh, probabilistic uh, language. So the zeta function we have introduced on uh, the, the first slide. So um, so because the action takes place here, so just let me uh, maybe draw something. So this would, this would be my axis here. Okay, so this would be maybe, uh, yeah. 
So this is going to be, yeah, this is going to be my uh, half line. And uh, so there will be zeros here. So if, let's assume the Riemann hypothesis, some of these results do not assume them, but they are just for simplicity, you know. So we have these zeros. So what, uh, and this is the half line and there are, uh, so, Many of the challenges, and I try to give you some of them, is to look at uh, this function when t is real. So what happens here? So which is the, the distribution of the values of the zeta function, or we will see the, the distribution of the values of uh, these uh, imaginary parts. So do, I mean, how, how do they look like statistically? Okay, so these are the questions. Uh, so the, here you have a bunch of points. They're not random, but you can try to wonder what they, they look like, something, uh, some remarkable uh, distribution that we know in nature. And same thing for the zeta function. So for the zeta function, the problem was uh, solved some time ago. So it's actually a theorem which does not uh, uh, depend on the Riemann hypothesis. You can prove it unconditionally. So what he says is that if you take uh, the, the the zeta function on the half line, and uh, you know you 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 so here omega is a uniform random variable on zero one. So you have here a random variable which depends on, uh, so a familiar random variable is indexed by capital T. And when capital T goes to infinity, then this converges to uh, a complex Gaussian random variable. So here, these two real uh, Gaussian random variables are independent. So, uh, so that's, yeah, so that was, uh, Sel that is Selberg uh, central limit theorem. And that, that is typically, a uh, limit theorem about a sequence of random variables uh, here uh, defined in the complex, uh, taking values in the complex plane, and which uh, which require uh, some uh, some understanding, basic understanding of prime numbers in this case uh, to prove. And uh, so the proof essentially uh, makes rigorous uh, a sort of probabilistic. Uh, argument or approximation. So let's try to, I'll try to get to tell you what would be, so this would be the second point, try to find a model which will uh, tell you, uh, which will help you predict the behavior of your function. So if you want, uh, I'll try to explain this uh, here on uh, on these slides, and then I get back to the theorem because the theorem is, looks fancy, but it's actually uh, very easy. So what, what happens here is that, uh, if I take the Euler product here, uh, which was defining the zeta function, and uh, I'm looking at I'm looking at it on uh, the half line, and uh, so you know, I'm, if you, if I get back here, I'm just taking the Euler product, which is here, and then uh, then uh, looking at looking at it on the half line, which of course is not allowed. This is illicit because I don't know whether this works. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to truncate it. I'm going to truncate it. And uh, so what I get here, if I look at, so there is this, uh, yeah. So I will have things like P minus IT divided by square root of P. And uh, so this, this tells me that I, I, I mean, you know, uh, so what happens with these random variables, P minus IT or PIT, indexed by prime numbers. And when T, let's say, is taken uh, uniformly at random in interval of the form minus TT, T, zero T. Uh, uh, so what happens with this family of sequence of random variables? And actually it's not uh, difficult to show that this family of random variables is going to converge to uh, independent uh, random variables which are uniformly distributed on the unit circle because each of these random variables here is on the unit circle. And uh, so, oops, sorry. So, that's, uh, so that is the content of uh, this fancy looking proposition, but is not a fancy one, which, does, which just tells you that uh, in my uh, heuristic there, so these, uh, these random variables together will converge to independent random variables on the unit circle. So this suggested, so this is a long known model. So this suggested that uh, uh, maybe a good model could be this, uh, uh, this product. 
where the XPs are assumed to be uh, independent. So that's the naive part of the, of the statement that I mentioned earlier. So, uh, yeah, so you can, uh, so you can actually compute a lot of things about the ZN. So I put some details, but this is again, I mean, computations would just follow from uh, a classical uh, uh, hypergeometric uh, function theory. So you can, you can compute uh, anything you want. So the log of ZN would be log of zeta, like for Selberg. And uh, uh, so if you want, and uh, we can compute them, uh, we can compute the moment generating functions quite easily here because uh, each, for each of them, uh, each individual part, we know it's, that its moment generating function is given in terms of a hypergeometric function. And so we can, uh, we can prove uh, the following result about uh, Yn, which is, uh, remember, this, is, uh, this, this should be a model for log of uh, the zeta function. Uh, okay, there's this minus two, you can divide then by one, uh, by one half, and then uh, it's the same. So, uh, so what we get, from these little computations, which are not difficult, which are standard, is uh, you get a central limit theorem. So this is, uh, you know, so if you compare with Selberg, so Selberg was telling you that you have uh, uh, one half log log t. So this here you have this one half log uh, log log n. So this could be a, a good intuition for uh, for uh, for Selberg's uh, central limit theorem. So this could give you, uh, you know, a sort of heuristic and actually. One way of proving Selberg central limit theorem is making this uh, uh, heuristic approximation rigorous and uh, uh, approximating uh, the zeta function with uh, some functions of uh, the log of the zeta function with some uh, sum of the prime numbers and so on. But, uh, but this would essentially making this sort of argument rigorous. And the same actually works for the Erdoskak theorem. So if I had time, I was in a lecture. I would in parallel do uh, the exact same thing with, the, with omega n. So now the question getting back is, okay, so let's try to be whether we can be smart and uh, let's pick, a, uh, let's pick a, a result, which we know is open in, uh, in analytic number theory. And let's try to see whether this uh, probabilistic model that I've just built is helping me uh, in any sense to, to uh, proving the, I mean, getting a hint at what the result should be and possibly uh, proving it. So one, one result, which is, uh, so just, uh, sorry, just, I, I just want to make one quick, uh, say one quick thing here. So for a long time, this was called, uh, so some people were calling this the stochastic zeta function. But it's not so. That's why my title is called a stochastic zeta function because we're going to have another one that people named. Uh, uh, essentially, this is after uh, a recent work uh, uh, of last year by Valko and Virag uh, that I will introduce another function called uh, stochastic zeta function. So this is one for obvious reason, but there, there, I'm going to show you another one. So here's a problem which is uh, which has been open at least uh, for uh, yeah for. Uh, since the 1900s, so uh, it's, com it's about the, the moments of the zeta function. So analytic number theorists look at this object here. And uh, why do they look at? So one of the reason, quick reason to uh, ju justify it is that it, it can give you access. Uh, it, if you are able to show that this is big O of T to the epsilon for every epsilon strictly positive, then this shows the Lindelof hypothesis, which is the uh, conjecture that one half plus IT is big O of T to the epsilon for every epsilon strictly positive. So that could be one motivation to look at uh, this quantity. There are many others. And, uh, but the thing is that this is, this is uh, an extremely hard problem. So results, so the theorems are known only for the case uh, K equals one, which is a result due to Hardy and Littlewood, I think in 1916 and the case, uh, uh, K equals two, which is due to Ingham, I think it's 1920. So the British School of Analytic Number Theory. And after that, there were conjectures uh, in the 90s for the case K equals three and K equals four. And so when people wanted to find out, I mean, how do you get access? It's an extremely hard problem. How would you get access to it? So you could ask yourself, okay, does this function uh, Zn, my stochastic zeta function, could, could it be of any help into this uh, making this prediction? 
So what you do is, uh, so it's, it's a very simple corollary of uh, the, the, the computations I've, I've made here. So uh, these things here. So we can show that uh, the two case moment of the modulus of Zn is asymptotically equal to log nk squared times ak, where ak is this factor, which is here. So now you could say, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's compare with what uh, uh, the known results for the case uh, k equals one and two give, and then what uh, the result conjecture for k equals three and four. So when you go there, already with the case k equals two, you, you see that uh, it's not true. So this model does not predict it. So what it does is that it, pre it predicts the right order of magnitude. It predicts this, uh, it, it seems to have this factor into it, but there are, the more you up with K, the more it seems there are extra factors uh, showing up here. So, uh, so now the question is, uh, yeah, so I mean, so what do we do now? Because the model is obviously failing to make the right uh, predictions. So that's where now I mean, this is uh, bringing us to uh, to our new uh, to to more uh, a more modern approach of this problem. And this is uh, so uh, the question is: Do we need? I mean, is there another model that would make this prediction, or that you know, what happens? So this is where now we jump to uh, the years two thousand and uh, uh, the interaction between uh, random matrices and analytic number theory. So the first thing I would like to do is uh, so to show you something else. So here, what we did, so I told you, so the question is, so if you, if you, look, at, if you look at this problem here, so does it uh, display some, uh, so the value distribution that displays some uh, remarkable uh, behavior, does it look like uh, uh, some remarkable random variable? And here for this case, we saw this is celebrate central limit theorem that we are essentially, this is the values are described essentially uh, within the Gaussian world, within the Gaussian framework. So which is uh, somehow to be expected because the Gaussian distribution is a uh, universal distribution. So now the second question you can ask yourself if you want to, you know, <clears throat> so if you want to build a model. So the first model we, we found was based on, uh, was based on, on this uh, earlier product. So the, the, the first model we built. But there, there is another way, maybe we could say, okay, there's this other product, <clears throat> but there is also something else in the theory of uh, holomorphic functions, which is that C is a, is, a, is a holomorphic function, is an entire function of order one. So it has a product, it can be expanded into product over its zeros. And the question is, can we use the, this product over zeros to, you know, for some model? to construct some new model. But then this would imply that we understand uh, something about the statistics of the zeros. And uh, so now what happens, so let's, let's now focus instead of looking at the values of the zeta function, let us look at these points here. So uh, do they have any, uh, do they uh, display any remarkable uh, future distribution? So uh, it's very remarkable that uh, we're going to see, at least conjecturally, that it is expected that this point here on the critical line can be described by another universal distribution, which is the sine kernel point process. So we know it's a universal distribution since the work, uh, recent work in the past 10, 15 years of on the one hand, uh, Tau Wan Wu and uh, uh, uh Schlein, uh, Yao Wan Yin and uh, the people that, that, that followed. So I, I just try to explain quickly, and of course I'm not going into this universal thing. I just because this is a uh, audience of probabilists, so I assume that everyone knows what a point process is. And uh, so what I do is, as, as, so I give the definition of uh, quickly, in in the most concise way I could of what a uh, uh, sine kernel point processes. So this is, uh, so it's, it's a point process. It could be indexed by the integers or positive integers or positive and negative integers, it doesn't matter. So it's a point process, which it, 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 it exists a unique point process, which is characterized by its correlation functions that is defined in the formula that I gave below, which is that for every uh, continuous and compactly supported functions, you take uh, the expectation and then you, 
uh, you know, you, you test over all different, uh, all distinct uh, intervals of your points. And, uh, and this is given by uh, the integral over Rn because we take the, we take n uh, point in our tests. And the integral is against this determinant here, which is a determinant n by n. And, uh, and the determinant is given by this kernel, which is uh, given by this uh, ratio of sine, uh, sine x and sine px by px. And it is, so this point process is called determinantal because there are many uh, family of point processes uh, that exist that appear naturally, especially in random matrix theory or in the study of the zeros of holomorphic functions, which can be expressed uh, under this form. It means that all the endpoint correlations are known and uh, they can be written. So this is the endpoint correlation and they can be given in terms of the determinant of some uh, kernel. So, uh, so the thing is, okay, so I'm giving you this abstract definition. So why do I do that? So the reason is because there are, uh, so recent work show that many uh, point processes or scaling limit of point processes that appear naturally, uh, I was going to say in nature, but at least, you know, in physical sciences, mathematical sciences, uh, for instance, a spectrum of eigenvalues or zeros of some random analytic functions uh, converge uh, asymptotically uh, will tend to, uh, a point process, which is the sine kernel point process given here. So that's why it is believed that this is a uh, uh, universal uh, distribution. And uh, I'm going to give you one example from one random matrix ensemble, which is relevant for my talk. But it, uh, this point process appears for many ensembles of random matrices in a universal way. So that's why it's called uni uh, universality result. So now, Okay, so what happens is that uh, since the work of Montgomery in 1972, which was extended later by Hedgehog and Rudnick and Sarnak, so it is believed, conjectured, that the ordinates, these ordinates of the zeros that I have uh, noted here, so if you look at them, so they should also be distributed like a sine kernel point process. So of course you have to uh, recall the von Mongold formula, which says that uh, the density of the zeros is of order log t divided by 2p times t. So it means that the, if you want uh, to observe something uh, meaningful, you have to stretch the zeros because otherwise they're too dense. So uh, <clears throat> hence this uh, scaling factor here. But once you scale them, then uh, it's, it is believed that this uh, number, this quantity here, this, this test things should converge to a uh, determinantal point process. So Montgomery conjectured this result in the case n equals two. Then it was extended to case n equals three by Hedgehog in the 90s and then la later by Rudnick and Sarnak to n uh, larger than three. And what happened is that they are able to show that this is a theorem for eta, which is uh, which has its uh, Fourier transform. For instance, Montgomery showed that it's, it is for for eta c infinity with Fourier transform in minus one one. It's a theorem, but then you know uh, the conjecture is essentially true uh, beyond that. So that's the so-called uh, GUE conjecture, which is one of the thing the the words that appeared in my title, which is that uh, the zeros, the ordinates of the zeros of the zeta function on the critical line. So these points. The same way that the zeta function, the log of the zeta function uh, behaves like this universal Gaussian distribution. So these points here also behave like this, uh, another universal distribution at the level of point processes, which is a sign kernel point process. So uh, if you want, if I want to rephrase the way in the way I did for Selberg central limit theorem, so it means in the language of point processes that this family of point processes indexed by N and where omega is a uh, uniform random variable in zero one converges in low to a sine kernel point process. So this was, uh, so as I told you, and I'm going to uh, uh, now make it more clear. So the reason why this attracted a lot of attention when Montgomery made his conjecture for the case N equals two is that uh, in 1972, he was discussing this with uh, Freeman Dyson and Dyson told him, uh, oh, but you know, this is, uh, this type of behavior you, you, you conjecture for the, the zeta function. So in physics, uh, I have shown it, uh, and also Eugen Wigner, for some ensemble of random matrices, we see exactly this correlation function. So in the case n equals two, 
what you see essentially when you take n equals two, the determinant is uh, is pretty easy, and you see something like a sine of px divided by px squared. So that was what Montgomery had ob uh, observed histor historically. I mean, it should be over to, uh, yeah, uh, two variable and so on, but this is, uh, it was for, for the differences. So this is what he had observed. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, so then that was, uh, there was excitement because then this reminded people of the so-called Polya Hilbert spectral approach. So which is that, so it is said that when Hilbert proved his spectral term for Hermitian operators, he thought, oh, okay. So the proof of the Riemann hyp hypothesis is now uh, handy, it, it's going to be, it's going to ha happen soon because uh, all we have to do is to find an operator uh, whose spectrum will be the, uh, such that if you write the zeros one half plus uh, I, let's say gamma N, this gamma N, so you can always write the zeros like that, but this gamma N would then be the spectrum of a Hermitian operator and bonded operator, and then this will imply they will be real and this would imply the Riemann hypothesis. So that's what, that's essentially the idea of the uh, polya hilbert spectral approach. And so the spectrum of random matrices, spectrum of polya hilbert approach. So then that's why it, it attracted uh, some attention. And uh, besides, there's something I don't mention that I will mention later. At the end of the 90s, 99, 2000, so Katz and Sarnak showed that the Montgomery's conjectures were actually theorems in the function field case. So zeta function of a finite field. And, uh, and then inspired by this conjecture uh, and you know, its revival in the 90s by uh, the work of uh, Sarnak, Rutnik, Hedgehog, and then Katz and Sarnak. So uh, Kidding and Snyde tried to, to, get, to give another shot at the problem of evaluating moment, but this time building a model coming from random matrix theory. So what could be a, a good model? So what happens is, uh, so I have to tell you quickly what this is. So this is again, I mean, I, I just give you quickly what they are, describe the objects. So from the works of uh, Katz and Sarnak, it appears that uh, the, right, the right random matrix ensemble, and this is confirmed later by the work of Kidding and Snape, is uh, the so-called circular unitary ensemble. So which is uh, uh, the group, the unitary group, the group of, of isometries of CN. So this is all unitary matrices. So we know that for them, the eigenvalues are all going to be on uh, the unit circle. So now if I want, uh, if I was to drive uh, a, uh, uh, to, to draw, sorry, a, a circle. So I don't know, I can do it. I hope the app is helping me, yes. So the zeros would be uh, like, a, the, uh, the, the eigenvalues are parameterized by the angles. So this would be, yeah theta one, uh, theta two, theta three, etc. And uh, so now the question is, uh, we know that the unitary group, I mean, it's a compactly group, so it is naturally endowed with uh, a unique probability measure, which is invariant on the left and right translation, which is the R measure. And so now the question, so this is one, this is the natural canonical measure to put on the integral group. So now the question is, if I take the hard measure on the integral group, what does it imply for the distribution of uh, these angles here? And this is something due to Hermann Weil, uh, all result uh, due to Hermann Weil, who showed that uh, the distribution of the angles uh, is given uh, by this density here. So what this means is that you can, uh, uh, so essentially what this tells you is that if you take, uh, if you take, if you want to compute expectation of a function which is symmetric in the eigenvalues, then all you have to do is to integrate them, for instance, on an interval of, of length two pi with respect to this density here. So that's what allowed people to compute statistics for, for, for this random matrix ensemble. So the circular unitary ensemble is this unitary group equipped with the Haar measure and uh, the distribution it implies on the so-called eigenangles. So these, the angles of the eigenvalues. So what you can show is that, uh, so I'm not going to detail here, is that uh, 
you can compute essentially any uh, relevant statistics you, uh, you like on the eigenvalues because you can compute this p-point correlation for every p. And this is given by, uh, uh, again, some determinant. So it's a determinant or point process. So, the, uh, th so these angles here for every n, so now I will get a sequence of angles. So theta 1, theta n for every n. So later I will need to multiply them by n divided by 2p because there are n of them in the interval 0 to p. So I, I need to have mean spacing 1. So I will do this later. But this family of eigenangles is going to uh, be a determinant, finite determinant of point process as well. And its p-point correlation can be computed. So this is, uh, so there's, a, there's of course some work to be done. It's not very difficult. So you take advantage of the fact that this can be written as a Van Damme determinant and you play around, you do some basic uh, uh, algebra here and you can compute these, uh, these quantities here. So basic algebras plus Weiss integration formula. And uh, so the kernel is explicit. And uh, now you see that uh, so the, everything is explicit. And what you can observe is that when you scale the eigenvalues by n divided by 2p, as I uh, told you before, to have mean spacing 1, then you can show that there exists a point process we call e infinity here, such that, uh, yeah, so, and this inf infinity is a sine kernel point process. So what it tells us is that the eigenangles of the circular unitary ensemble after proper rescaling will converge to a sine kernel point process. So that's one example of uh, the sine kernel point process appearing uh, in random matrix uh, ensembles. And it actually it appears, for instance, for the GUE, uh, the, the Gaussian unitary ensemble, which is permission matrices filled with the uh, uh, Gaussian random variables and so on. So this is what, what you observe in these cases as well. So now, uh, so now we know that we have uh, so Montgomery's conjecture on, on extended to the GUE conjecture on one, on one side, the circular unitary ensemble, which also converges to this uh, sine kernel point process. So spectrally, the, the eigenangles uh, should be the same statistically as the ordinates of the zeros of the zeta function on the critical line. So then Keating and Snaith had the following uh, uh, conjecture that, uh, or guess, or philosophy, that a good model for the zeta function on the critical line uh, should be uh, the characteristic polynomial of a random unitary matrix because, uh, so if I look at this uh, quantity here, its zeros are going to be these eigenangles that we described before. It is conjecturally believed that the, asymptotically they, they have the same statistics as the zeros of the zeta function or those on the critical line, the, the ordinates on the critical line. And so uh, Kidney said, said, okay, so this, this uh, Zn uh, evaluated at any point on the unit circle should be a good model for distribution of values of the zeta function. The unit circle because uh, the zeros are on the unit circle. I mean, it's, it's all heuristic. So the, I don't have good reason why this is true. We don't know why this works, but yeah. So the unit circle should play the role of the critical line. And uh, actually since the hard measure is invariant under rotation, so you could replace this, at least the distribution of this is the same as the distribution of Zn at one. So it's the same distribution because of the rotation and variance property of the Haar measure. And uh, so what you can show uh, is, uh, so you have this product representation. So there is something fun here. So I'm going to tell you quickly how you can obtain this, so, but this is not uh, the way Keating and, and Snaith have done things originally. They have done it the hard way using Weiss integration formula and Selberg integrals. But what you can show is that this random variable here uh, can be represented in law as a product of independent random variables. So these theta k's, so these are uniform random variable on zero to p. So these are beta variables with parameters one k minus one. When k equals one, this is just uh, one, the direct mass at one. And all random variables at site here are independent. So somehow like the Euler product for the stochastic zeta function, we, also, we can also show that uh, this uh, determinant, this characteristic polynomial, can be written in law as a product of independent random variables. So now when I say that, so because, I mean, none of these variables are, are impressive, they're pretty simple and everything is independent. So what we can show then, this is what Keating and Snaith did differently, but now we have a, a quick access with this representation. So this representation will follow from a construction I will give you uh, later. 
So then there is a central limit theorem, like for Selberg, and uh, but except that here he, the scale is not the same; it's log n, and you have assumpted you can assumptively compute the moments of the characteristic polynomial, and you find these numbers. And now if you try to see whether this gives you the right prediction for uh, the, the zeta function, you, you compute the values k equals one, two, three, and four for those for which there are theorems and conjectures. And then you see that it doesn't work again. But quite surprisingly, it seems that this is, uh, from what you observe in the case k equals one, two, three, and four, is that this is the missing factor to get the whole conjecture. So you see somehow the, the stochastic zeta, uh, zeta model gave, gave you this ak, it was not enough. So it was conjectured that some factor was missing. And this missing factor is given by this random matrix thing. And it seems, and we don't under, so numerics tend to show that this conjecture is correct. And, uh, but I mean, we don't know why. We don't know how it works. We don't know how uh, these two quantities are mixed together. So the, the earlier product is based on independent, uh, on a model with, with uh, primes. This one is based on a model obtained with uh, the, the zeros of uh, uh, characteristic polynomials or something that approximates the, statistically the zeros of zeta. So now the question is, yeah, so, so what, what happens next then, right? So the question, so, so, here, so here are some questions that then uh, were raised naturally. So, to explain the question that was raised by Katz and Sarnak initially is that in random matrix theory, and this is a lot the case today, one usually proceeds as follows. So you make your computations like we did here for a finite n when you can, and then you let n go to infinity. But somehow the matrices of order n and n plus one are not really uh, correlated together. So you make your computations for finite n and then you let n go to infinity. And, uh, and then of course the tool you have, you have matrix integrals, you use partition, partition, and you have a lot of things which are natural, which appear naturally in, in uh, uh, statistical physics, mathematical physics more generally, in uh, representation theory and so on, that, or in analysis like Selberg integrals and can be used. Uh, but then the, the question that was raised from the, uh, the work of Katz and Sarnak, especially motivated by the finite aspects is, uh, are there infinite dimensional objects which say uh, which sit, which would sit uh, you know above all random matrices that we have here, and such that you know we recover the finite n random matrix theory by some sort of projection, but then this uh, higher order point of view would uh, provide us with a space which is large enough and on which, uh, for instance, the convergence is taking uh, place almost surely. So that's one question which was raised, and uh, the, the fact that it's uh, I mean, it's not a trivial question. It's because, uh, so when you look at un, the integral, the unity group of size n, and you look at un plus one, so you cannot really build a, a model based on uh, just the, the product of the spaces and the product of the hard measures because uh, of the zero one law. The zero one law tells you that anything that's built on independent, on independent model will converge to something uh, trivial. And here we know that the limit is a sign candle point process. So it cannot be that, uh, you know, we can uh, just uh, take as a space the, the whole, uh, the product of the UNs and the product of the hard measures. And, uh, the, and the problem is also, I mean, what does it mean to converge almost surely? So, you know, you take, uh, uh, you take your, your eigenvalues here, theta one, theta n, and you want to show that this converges almost surely, but then at n plus one, so, for, so you have to fix omega, to say almost sure convergence. So for uh, almost all omega, but here, what would be the omega here? So that's the sort of questions you have to, to be able to answer. And another question uh, which appeared uh, and which occupied the people uh, at some point was in the mid 2000s. So the question uh, was raised of finding a scaling limit uh, from the characteristic polynomial. So since it seems from the work of Keating, Snape and many, uh, uh, works that followed their works that the characteristic polynomial is really a relevant object. So now the question is, uh, uh, is there a scaling, a natural scaling limit for the characteristic polynomial? So you could start, I mean, uh, so I, I was a grad student, a postdoc, you know, when I uh, made my first attempt. So you, 
you want to say, okay, I take uh, with my notation, I take Zn divided, but I, I don't know. So is that n of uh, E alpha divided by uh, some n to some thing and so on and try to see what happens. And it, it, I mean, it, it doesn't work. There's nothing that uh, appears naturally when you do things like that. So, uh, and uh, at the same time, motivated by uh, number theory problems, there was another, uh, another set of open problems in the late 2000s, which were raised, which is uh, to understand uh, the ratio of these characteristic polynomials evaluated at different points, the same number of points uh, above and below. And uh, so these are very re relevant for, uh, for analytic number theorists. They would like to know the, the same problem for the zeta function. So the question was, so first of all, uh, does this uh, ratio convert to something? So, I mean, it doesn't look obvious at all when you look at it. And can you compute the expectation of these uh, uh, ratios? So uh, towards the computation of the expectations, there is a, uh, a body of very remarkable work that somehow didn't attract the attention, deserved to attract, was the work by uh, Borodin or Chansky's half, which was uh, following the work by Fyodor and Strauf. And then there were uh, works independently with different techniques by Bump and Gamber using representation theory, Conry farmers in Baum using supersymmetry, Con Conry Snate, et cetera using all sorts of different arguments to try at least to compute the, the expectation of the ratios here. And uh, they obtain different results based on representation results. So hopefully they should be the same, but it's not always obvious to see they're the same, but it depends on the representation they use. For instance, I personally never understood uh, the supersymmetry approach of, uh, for, for, to compute the ratios. So now what I'm going to do here is uh, for in the last, uh, maybe if you allow 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, show you a, uh, a solution to these problems. So uh, the scaling limit and uh, as a consequence, a solution to this uh, ratios conjecture, which, is, uh, which naturally appears uh, in the probabilistic uh, setting. So for this, I will, uh, so I, I take the historical approach we took because now we can do it differently, but I find, yeah, I, I find this nice and also, I'm now finishing uh, some work with uh, Joseph Nagenudel and it's not over yet. So I, could, I wasn't feeling ready to prepare to present them today, but which uh, substantially generalizes what I've done here and result by others I show later. But yeah, it's, maybe it's, it's a story for another day. So I, I take you this one because anyway, for a probabilistic uh, seminar, it's, it's, it's very nice because uh, this, is, uh, uh, this, this is an idea which is very probabilistic that uh, I mean, in some sense, you could not expect non probabilist maybe to come up with such ideas, which is based uh, on the idea, which is familiar to many of you uh, that I know in this audience, uh, the idea of coupling. So how can we couple all dimensions of our random matrices together? So uh, the idea, uh, so I'm going to propose a construction which finds this idea in a construction by uh, Kirov, Olshansky, and Bershik for so-called per virtual permutation. So I extend their construction to uh, the, uh, unitary groups. So because I don't have, I mean, I was slow at the beginning of my talk, so I'm just going to tell you quickly how, how, this, uh, how this works. So the idea behind is, uh, so I give you the idea here, and then uh, the construction is that I would, I would go uh, from, uh, I would construct a, uh, my UN plus one, so this would be, Uh, CUE n plus one, which is a random inter matrix of size n plus one. And what I want is to obtain it, let's say, uh, by composing it uh, with UN. So I assume I know what UN is, and I want to go to UN plus one by composing it to the left with some transformation. And I need this transformation to be uh, simple enough. Of course, it should be uh, unitary. And uh, of course, what I want is that uh, at every stage, my uh, UNs remain hard distributed. And so what I want is to construct this tower of transformation in, in, uh, like that. So uh, the idea is, uh, so the simplest transformation you can think of is so-called complex reflections. So these are uh, unitary transformations which uh, can be determined with two unitary vectors. So it's, uh, uh, so if you take two vectors of norm one in CN, there's a unique uh, unitary transformation which maps one uh, onto the other. 
and such that the rank of identity minus this transformation is one. So with these two conditions, then you get a very simple transformation, which is referred to uh, classically in, uh, in, in the theory of groups as a complex refraction. And, uh, and this transformation here, so by induction, I can then I will I can go down and you know R n minus one, R two, R one, and these transformations. So to to construct them, I will uh, I need uh, I will need to know. So R n is in uh, is is going to be is let's say in C n or C n plus one. So I want it uh, is going to be perfectly determined uh, by maybe I should call it R n plus one to be more coherent. Rn plus one of En plus one. So this is the, the my, uh, so the ENs are going to be my canonical basis of Cn. And uh, Rn plus one should be some vector Xn plus one. So I want, I define Rn plus one such that it maps the N plus one element of the canonical basis to Xn plus one and Xn plus one is going to be uniform on the unit sphere of Cn plus one. And, uh, and I take the XNs to be independent. And if I do so, uh, I can show that then I obtain uh, a family of uh, uh, transformation in CUE. And, and, uh, and that's how I will, uh, I, I will do, I will construct my space. So to summarize, so I will start by considering a sequence of independent random vectors, XN being uniformly distributed on the unit sphere. And then I will choose my complex reflection, which is the unique uh, unit transformation such that identity minus Rn has rank one and which maps En on Xn. And then I define Un like this with U1 being just the vector X1. And what I can show is that uh, th uh, this way, every Un I obtain is uh, hard distributed on uh, Un and uh, and so I get a tower. So that's uh, in, in the language, in, in a more algebraic language, that's a projective limit. And uh, I call UN, the U infinity, the space of such sequences that I call, and, this, uh, and these sequences are called, I call them virtual isometric. And on U infinity, I can define the projective limit of the mu uh, and I obtain a sort of hard measure on this, uh, on this space, U infinity. And now on this space, after some work, so we started with Bourgat and Najnudel, and then later with the uh, Maples, Najnudel, and then Shaibi and Najnudel, we improved our estimates and so on. We can show that on the space U infinity, on which I have put all my uh, CUEN and uh, other transformations, that my uh, rescaled eigen uh, values, so these are my scale, so this is the eigen value, the Kate eigen value of. Uh, UN, so there are N of them. So this converges almost surely to a sign kernel point process that is uh, called YK. And uh, I have a good control on, uh, at least good enough for what I want to do on the error I'm making. So, uh, so what we've done here is that we've answered positively the first question by uh, Katz and Sarnak is that we can construct a space which sits above uh, the, the circular unitary ensembles of all different dimensions by decoupling, and we can obtain uh, almost a convergence of the eigen uh, uh, angles to a sine kernel point process. So this way, everything is uh, explicit, constructed explicitly, and I mean, uh, of course, there's a lot of work to do uh, to, to to get to these estimates. Uh, you use uh, what I showed you initially. The, uh, the determinantal structure, you use some fine properties of, uh, of, of, of these kernels and so on, and you get to these, uh, to these points. So, uh, so yeah, so what he says, and this is uniform, it means that uh, when n is equal to infinity, this is uh, the sign kernel, this is just yk, and, uh, and you recover the fact that the sign kernel point process, this k point is of order k, plus some fluctuation of order log modulus of k. So once you have that, then you, uh, you can start to try to think what should be the natural scaling limit of the characteristic polynomial. And in fact, uh, what we realized is that to obtain this scaling limit, you need to divide not by something uh, constant, but by uh, another random variable. And you have to look at it on the scale at which you observe the sign kernel point process. It means that uh, you have to divide by n here. So which was what was suggested by people who were looking at this uh, problem of uh, 
computing the ratios here. Okay, so once you have that, so of course, with just a little amount of work using these estimates, which require much more work, but from that, this is then easy uh, uh, basic analysis. You can show that this CN will converge almost surely an uniformly and compact subset of C to this random analytic function, which is given here. And this product has to be understood in the uh, principal value uh, uh, sense. Uh, so recall that YK is of order K. So this is of order mi minus K. So this product will converge uh, absolutely. So then what we observe is that, yeah, we obtain naturally this uh, random analytic function. And uh, so this is the function, this C infinity function. So this is the function which recently in 2020, there's a very beautiful paper, uh, I will uh, mention them again as soon, by Valko and Vira, where they uh, studied this function we uh, have introduced. They uh, call it the stochastic zeta function and they study many of its properties. So, it's, it's a, so they have found out a lot of properties that we did not find in the first place of this function. It's, it's really a remarkable function and we believe it's a, it's a, it's a universal uh, object as well. And, and this is the, uh, and this is the, the confirmed by the upcoming, uh, by, by the, yeah, by the soon done work by Najdal and myself. So what you have to know here, if uh, I want to compare with what happens uh, with the usual case of random holomorphic functions. So typically, if you look at the literature, a random analytic function is given by uh, this. So the ANs are going to be independent and they're going to, uh, so typically they're going to be Gaussian and so on. So for instance, if you take Gaussian here uh, with some uh, design, I mean, with some well-defined uh, variance structure, you obtain that the zeros here are the terminal point process in the units. So this is a work by uh, Virag, uh, Perez and Virag. But what you do here essentially, I mean, in this case is you consider these functions here and then you know what you have is this, you have of course a second moment and so on and you can work with them. But here, what you have to note is that it's, it's uh, so we work with the zeros rather and these, whether it's CN or CNP, they even do not have an expectation. So this is uh, to be put in contrast with what uh, usually you, you, you see in the study of random analytic functions. So in, in a recent work so I was mentioning, so referring to Valko and Virag have called this uh, infinity stochastic data function. So they obtain a lot of remarkable properties. Specifically, they have very nice uh, representation of uh, uh, the distribution of the coefficients of this uh, random analytic function. And uh, so what we have done in some paper, which published later with uh, my group in Zurich uh, and Joseph Nashudel is that we showed similar conversions for the GUE cases. And uh, in work in progress with Joseph, we extend this. So we uh, extend the result uh, that were obtained here by uh, Valcon Direct for beta ensembles. The result we have here, other results by Packet, uh, by Lambert and Packet, to a much more, uh, into a much, we put in the much more general framework based on properties of, uh, a converging family of point processes, but as I said, this is another story. So let's just uh, stick with the, to that one. So uh, I just like take five minutes to conclude quickly. So now you see that, uh, yeah, the ratio conjecture has a very simple answer because, uh, and this is uh, because we, everything converges almost surely. So all these objects I divide by lambda uh, Zn1 here and here, the right amount of time, it's the number of time. So they will converge to this ratio of uh, xin infinity function. And uh, so now the question is, okay, so, uh, so, so now I, I just passed this because uh, for sake of time. So now the question is, so what does it learn? What does it tell us about if I go to, when I try to define probabilistic number theory, the first, so this is, uh, this was the third point. So it gives, uh, it, it gives birth to questions which are difficult and interesting. So this was the question of uh, these questions that I have given you a solution in the random matrix uh, world. So now what does it tell us for, for Zeta? So that's a, that's a question. So what we conjecture is that uh, this quantity here, this ratio of Zeta should converge uh, in low uniformly in the parameter Z on compact sets to this C infinity function we have here. So, uh, so this is a conjecture. So with Joseph, so in work in what we're doing now, so what we, what we have been able to show is that uh, uh, it's very interesting. So it's very close to, it's 
I mean, I strongly believe this is true because uh, if I ask, I mean, I can, we can show a stochastic version of Hurwitz theorem for random holomorphic functions. And this uh, theorem tells us that the stochastic zeta conjecture, which is this conjecture here, implies the full GUE conjecture. So now the question is, can it be used for, uh, to, uh, to show, uh, yeah, can it be used to, to show, uh, it can be used sorry, to, to show the jury conjecture itself. I don't know. So it's, uh, but it, this is a statement about a convergence in law in a function space. Yeah, maybe some tightness arguments and so on, at least to partially get some results. Uh, I don't know. So this is something we're thinking about. I mean, and then uh, if, if we, we assume the Riemann hypothesis and that the zeros are simple, which are commonly believed to be true, then you can show that the Dewey conjecture implies a stochastic zeta conjecture. So in fact, what happens is that this should be equivalent, this conjecture should be equivalent to the full Dewey conjecture. So we have put the Dewey conjecture into a, a sort of a stochastic process convergence uh, uh, yeah, version. And what this confirms is that uh, pure random matrix statistics is observed at the microscopic scale. So this should be uh, put to contrast with the moments conjecture when we had this random matrix factor, this uh, stochastic zeta in the initial one, the first one factor based on primes. So here, when you work at this scale, one over log t, you don't observe any, anything else than pure random matrix statistics. So that's the right uh, scale to use random matrix theory to make uh, only uh, conjectures in this uh, direction. And just to conclude uh, one, two minutes, so you can compute the ratio. So this was the other problem. So you can compute the ratio. So it's, I mean, it's work is technical. There, there, there are a lot of hard estimates to establish. So, I mean, unless you're really interested into it. Uh, yeah, so this is the paper uh, uh, of like three years ago with Shaibi, Naj Nudel, uh, and myself. So you can show, yeah, you can show this, uh, compute this expectation of ratios. And you can also, yeah, you can, uh, of course, get the corresponding conjecture uh, as well here. So what happens is that you can go uh, further from here to, to, to other places and, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. I think for, for today it's enough uh, of these, uh, yeah, equations. But one, one thing, you know, I, I'd like to mention is that you see that, I mean, there, there's a question why the CUE and not, for instance, the GUE. So if you take the, if you take the GUE, the GUE, the, so we, we can show, we were able to show in this paper I mentioned with <clears throat> some of the people in my groups, that you have a convergence to uh, this C infinity, but it's not exactly C infinity. There is a, this EIP Z factor, which is missing, and there is something else that, that's added there. And you cannot make the right uh, you cannot make the right predictions with this. Although it's almost the same function, you cannot make the the same prediction. But it, it's something which is which would be worth like 10, 15 minutes of discussion that we don't have here. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, I run uh, a little over time, and I'd like to thank you very much for having stayed so far with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eskan. Thank you. Uh, amazing. Uh... I must say that's challenged me quite a bit. <laughs> so, uh, it, it looks impressive. Uh, I'll let others ask questions and make comments. So, can you hear me? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Andrew. Please go ahead. I'm always worried about these things. Um, so, the conjecture gives you another probabilistic model, which is doing something else, but turns out to give the right answers. Uh, are people still looking for a sort of probabilistic model, let's say universal one, that would actually give the Riemann uh, zeta function, as it were, or statements about it? It's so that's a good question. So for instance, this, these are the sort of questions Joseph and I are asking ourselves today. I mean, could we put, so, this uh, so this conjecture I put this slide so this uh, this C infinity you see here mm. so this is a conjecture but we believe this should be true because of this part of, of course I mean yeah these are uh, so this implies GUE so that's a, that's a theorem uh, but 
yeah, under a ratio, it, it seems that they're equivalent. So if you want to, so if you want at the, at the microscopic scale, this is the function you should observe. But the moment conjecture of Keating and Snape is, is at the macroscopic scale. Right. And there you have, to, you, you need to have, uh, uh, to understand the interplay between uh, the primes and the zeros. And that's where, uh, I mean, we, we don't know what happens there. And uh, that would be key. In fact, I mean, I think, I mean, if one person is able to understand this interplay, I think this person will be able, will make a big, uh, a significant breakthrough. But at this point, we don't know. See, there, there are models uh, in the mid 2000s by uh, Chris Hughes, uh, Keating, Steve Gonek, David Farmer, and so on, trying to, they call the hybrid model, trying to mix uh, primes and uh, 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 random matrix statistics. Uh, they're, they're, these are very nice work, but I don't think they, they bring a, a, a significant insight to, uh, towards the question you are, uh, you, you are asking. So now, yeah, I mean, and interesting enough, you know, you have the same, that's what I said. If I had time, I would, uh, if I was teaching in a class with, on a big blackboard, I would present in parallel the case of omega n. And you have the, exactly the same problem happening with omega n. So if you compute the moment of omega n, uh, like we did, you would find two factors. One, which is described by, uh, the model of uh, Marquette and, and another factor which is given by random permutations, the total number of cycles. So that's, mm -hmm. that's where, you know, so, I mean, in 2006, seven, when I first moved to Zurich, I asked you questions about uh, uh, cycles of random permutations and yeah, that was for, for these sorts of things. So, so you have the same thing. So uh, we don't know why, uh, how the statistics on primes and random permutations mix up for omega n as well. So, and it's the same here, yeah, but probably at a much more complicated level of the statistics of uh, the zeros and the primes. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I don't have, a, I don't have a good insight here, further insight, uh, unfortunately now. Thanks. I'll just ask a very naive question. <laughs> What's the importance of the uniform um, distribution there in that uh, stochastic zeta? Conjecture. No, uh, so th this, this this one here, I think it's uh, I, I think it's not it's not relevant. So good question. I think you can you can essentially put uh, any uh, reasonable uh, uh, yeah, for example, random variable with density and so on. Yeah, the exponential would would you know sounds like it, it, a, a it, it should work. It should work. Yeah. It should work. And in, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, this 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 should not be of. Uh, so the reason I took this is historically Selberg Selberg uh, stated. Of course, Selberg was not. I mean, Selberg did even not recognize. That what he was getting in the limit, I mean, he may, might recognize, but he didn't mention that he was the Gaussian distribution when he showed his <laughs> central limit theorem. And uh, so, I, I, yeah, this, this omega uniform 0, 1 or 1, 2, if you want uh, some authors do that, is just a historical choice. But, uh, yeah. but uh, you know, if you try with other things, it doesn't simplify, I mean, at least not that I see, it doesn't simplify the problem. And uh, yeah, so this is just to stick to the historical. Uh, but but, but, they, but they're, they're all bounded, you know, the ones that you mentioned are all bounded distributions. Have you, you know, would it make any difference if it was unbounded, like exponential? No, 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 I don't think so. No, 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 really no, I don't, yeah, it's, uh... So you can look, so there is a, so, uh, so one of my former postdocs, Brad Rogers, uh, in his PhD, he did with Tao, looked at, uh, uh, these questions with uh, replacing this with other, uh, not this conjecture because he didn't know this conjecture, but the one, the Dewey conjecture and replace the uniform with other, I think he essentially could take any density. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, any other question, comment? If, okay, we're back. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, if no other, questions or comments, please join me in thanking Ashkan for a very, very nice talk. Thank you, Ashkan. Thank you very much. Thank you.